Good morning. On behalf of the officers of this church, we welcome you here this morning. Glad you're here on this beautiful, sunshiny day. Where else should we be? It's a beautiful day. Uh, we got lots of announcements in the bulletin. We got a lot of things going on this month. So be sure you read all these and uh, mark them on your calendar. There is one thing I want to say about the food pantry. The food pantry needs our help. Uh, things look pretty, pretty uh, low down there. And uh, we're taking the deacons of sponsoring a food drive to benefit the local food pantry uh, through Easter. So the big box out here, just let's just fill that thing full and hope we have to unload it and fill it up again. So remember the food pantry and uh, just remember to uh, mark your calendars on, on the rest of this stuff. Now, if you'll stand, we'll do the call to worship. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making the wise simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired, and they then go. Even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Let us come together and worship before the table. His prayer for us. Amen. Keep standing if you don't mind, and let's sing our first hymn, How Great Thou Art. Verses 1, 3, and 4. Let's recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born on the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into the hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seateth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. The first scripture reading for the day is from Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 17. Hear the word of God. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who, who misses his name, misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all the work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not convert your neighbor's house. You shall not convert your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we continue in our worship, let us come before the Lord our God, confessing our sins that we might hear of his pardon this morning. First, let us pray silently and then together in unison. Let us pray. And now let us pray together. Almighty God, only you are holy. Only you are good. We stand before you convicted of our sins and broken under the weight of the law. Our pride of self and stubbornness seek to drive us from your presence. Do not hold us guilty or remember the sins of our youth, but save us by the righteous blood of the Lamb. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. And friends, that is the profession of the gospel. That is the good news. That is central to the story. That while we have fallen short, while we ourselves have counted ourselves out through our actions, through our misdeeds, by those things we have left undone, our disobedience, our lack of humility, whatever it is that has separated us from our God could not separate us eternally. For our God 
bridge the gap. He sent his son into this world that we might know him and understand and see the nature of his love. And that love so great that he stretched out his arms and being nailed to the cross for you and me, he took on our sins though he was without sin. And dying in our stead, he won for us our salvation. Therefore this day, hear and believe the good news. All those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen? amen. And amen. Now I invite our... Uh, children to come forward for time with youth. <laughs> well, I'd also like the person that's supposed to talk to the kids to come forward. <laughs> that's okay, I'll fake it. <laughs> Ow! Of course, I may have to have someone help me get back up. Well, how are you guys doing today? This is going to be really long because I prepared a lot to talk to you about. Actually, we are fortunate. We do, we do have a, something, a special occasion. Today is communion, so it's kind of a different time in the church. The um, communion table is set up a little differently. We put the candles in the back so that we have room for the communion. But we do have a candle here today. Do you know what that candle's for? Well, yes, that candle is for fire. It, 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 that's what makes the candle work. So, I, I, guess, I guess I should limit my questions. Do you know why we have the candle on fire on the communion table? And why it's pink? Any ideas? Well, I'll tell you what. We had a family that had a little baby born this week. So we have another person who's part of our church. When y'all were born, there was a candle placed in here for your honor. Just like we do for our old children because we like to celebrate them. And then of course as you grow older we, we like to celebrate you having a special time during the worship service for you to talk. And then when you get to a, a stage where you're, you're teenagers and kind of starting to understand things a whole lot better, we have what we call confirmation which can lead to if you haven't been baptized as a child you'll be baptized then. And at that point you become part of the family. And so we like to celebrate these different milestones. So today we have this candle to celebrate. We do communion because we celebrate what God did for us. And, you know, it's kind of like your birthdays. You guys like your birthday when you get to celebrate? Well, that's why the church has these different things. Um, in a couple of weeks we're going to have Easter, which is a great time to celebrate. Then we'll have Pentecost, which is the church's birthday, a great time to celebrate. And so there's lots of things that we celebrate because it... Basically, we look up to God, what it is that he's given us and made us happy. Today, we celebrate the birth of a child. We celebrate what Christ has done for us. And in this hour, we celebrate you guys because we really do enjoy having you with us and your smiles and, and, and your special comments, you know, in the Bible that says, and a child shall lead them. Because sometimes we as adults think we know everything. And we know a lot, so you still have to listen to your parents. But in raising children and having children, we actually learn a lot from y'all as well, which is pretty, pretty cool, especially a first child. I can tell you, when my son was born, it changed everything. And as he grew, it changed a lot more. And then he became a teenager, and it changed a whole lot. And then he went off to college, and things started normalizing. It was really kind of nice. No. But, so today, we want to celebrate all that you are and all that you give to the church. And just know that all these folks out here, they're your family, they love you, and they care for you, and they want to be here for you. So I'm going to pray over you and send you off to uh, the Children's Church, okay? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we celebrate the new child born into our church. We celebrate all the children that you've given to us. And ask your blessing upon these two and all of them. That through their innocence, through the joy that they bring, that we would remember all the gifts that you give us the precious moments sometimes it's not the huge things it's, it's not the sh promotions it's not the jobs it's not all that what's truly important are our friends our families and these dear little ones that you give to us help us to raise them to know you that they might live all their days under your care and your guidance we pray this and all things in Christ Jesus name amen and amen thank you so much now, do we have someone for Children's Church? Okay. I, I just didn't want to send him out in the hall. <laughs>
It's now time for the prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. Uh, if you have anyone else to add to this list, uh, you can do it after I run through here first, okay? All right, we have on our prayer list today Chandler Martindale, the Diana Barker family, the Carolyn Martin family, Sherry McGill Bledsoe, Brett Wyatt, Rick Yates, Marty McClure, and we have a happy for the Jeff and Caitlin Oregon, granddaddy out there, Eric, Macklin, Nail, Oregon. A baby girl. Isn't that precious? Your life's going to change, Eric. I can guarantee that. Right, Peyton? <laughs> we have two unspokens today. Mark Crocker, R.L. Mackin. Gina Crockett, Sherry Petty, the family of Albert Gordon, David Hardy, Jimmy Harper, Heron Yarbrough, Demetra Hickerson, COVID victims, teachers and students, health care workers, Madison Hardy, Bailey Now, Knox Anderson. Also we have Johnny Criswell, William Inman, Amy Crenshaw, Landon Matheny, and David Temple. Is there anyone else? Sherry Fisher. Sherry Fisher. State Tournament Travelers. State Tournament Travelers. Peabody girls are going to the State Tournament for the first time in a since the 90s, I think. 2007. Sorry about that. 2007. <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot about that, Gary. Anybody else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray for these people. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for your creation. We also thank you for another beautiful sunshiny day and for the abundance of blessings for this day. We ask you to consider every prayer request that we send your way. We lift these people up to you who are on our prayer list today. We ask for you to touch them with your healing hands and to bring to them hope and strength. Also be with the people who are grieving from the loss of a loved one. Bring to them comfort, love, and guidance for the coming days. Now, Father, make your presence felt as we recite the prayer that you taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us into temptation, but lure us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, now you can uh, make your way forward for the offering.
go to the Lord in prayer, please. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for, the, for you being the light of the world. Your word says that the earth is yours and everything in it. We now offer back a portion of what you have given us. You have said that whatever we give is acceptable to you if we give it with an eager heart. May your presence be with us every hour of the day. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. Let's see. not for you to understand. Now when I pray, my prayer is one. I pray His will, not mine be done. Cause after all, I'm just a man, and it's not for me to understand. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Today our uh, gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of John. We're reading from the second chapter, verses 13 through 22. Again, that is John 2, 13 through 22. I invite you to stand now for the reading of our gospel. John writes, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip out of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple, both sheep and cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, 
destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up again. The Jews said to him, The temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Quick survey. How many people in here like rules and regulations? Okay, we got, we got, we got a couple of other people. Look, I know it's true, because I remember in school, and I don't, I'm not blaming it, I don't want anyone to raise your hand on this one, but I know some of y'all secretly wanted to be the milk monitor or the hall monitor. <laughs> some of you actually volunteered for that. Didn't make the, the teacher make you do it. And when you were doing that, you really liked to go t t tell the other kids. I was one of the ones that was always getting, don't run in the halls, and I'm like going, stop me. And then run after me, I'm like, you're running now too. Now, how many of you kind of have a rebellious nature like that? Anybody? I, I, well, I'm about to say, I've heard some stories, so, you know, I've been here long enough that I do know a little bit. I'm not going to call anybody out. But, you know, there are those that really like rules and those that like to bend them, like to push up against them a little bit. But, I can tell you, now this, this is kind of a funny one, given my, my, my cantankerous youth. When I first came home at 17 and told my parents that I talked to a recruiter and joined the army, my mother almost fainted. She's like, you? And my dad's like, you know you have to do what they tell you. I'm like, I can do that. And my dad's like, oh, you will. <laughs> he was right. And I got to be right eventually. But you know, this idea about rules, one of the things I learned um, is they're important. You know, they are real simple when you're only dealing with small groups. You ever heard the story, I learned everything I need to know about life from kindergarten? And, and a lot of that's true. You know, to share, to take turns, to treat either other people as you would have them treat you. And that's pretty good when you're in a small group. But you see, the problem is, is the bigger the group size gets, the larger number of people that are involved, the interpretations of those simple rules start getting a little complex. They start getting a little out there. And with these different interpretations, you then get conflict. And so you actually, at that point, need a written set of rules. You see, the Israelites, the Hebrews, had started off with patriarchs, they started off with prophets, they had judges, they had a few people that would just come and give them answers here and there. But at this point in their life, they're in the wilderness. And remember, they become so numerous that the Egyptians were scared of them. And so it wasn't just Isaac and Jacob and the twelve boys. It was all their people and all those that would go with it. And so in order to sort of help them prepare to enter into this new era with God and in God's plan, God speaks to them. He offers them what we have come to know as the Ten Commandments. Now, in this particular version, they're listed more like covenants, the way they come out. But we, we, hopefully we recognize them, right? When, as soon as we started reading them, everybody's like... Now, how many of you had to memorize those when you were younger? Really? That few? Because, you know, I was, I was in, you know, chaplain's education. I still had to learn, you know. And I know with my first church, we had some of the ladies there. They're like, those kids will learn the commandments. And they did. Another rule. But you see, sometimes when we have these rules, they're not so oppressive. Matter of fact, a lot of times, you know, when people think about the Ten Commandments, especially outside of the church, they're like, oh, you Christians, you have so many rules, so many regulations, so much stuff that you have to do, and so much stuff you can't do. And I would imagine that from time to time, some of us have kind of thought of the commandments as that, a big, you know, set of rules that's hanging over us. Anybody? Okay, I got a couple honest people. Other people going, oh no, I, I saw... I mean, now, you can agree with most of them. I mean, you know, there's some really easy ones. Thou shalt not kill. I think we all pretty much go, yep, that, that's a good one. Thou shalt not steal. Yep, not a problem. A coveting. 
that I'm not 100% sure what coveting is all the time, so I'll go with that. I don't do that either. Um, then they start getting tricky. Honor thy father and mother. Keep the Lord's Sabbath. Because it doesn't really tell you how to keep the Lord's Sabbath, does it? And what exactly does it mean to honor your father and mother? Does that mean that when your parents do something that might not be, you know, and parents, I, I know we're perfect in almost every way. Yet we're human too. And the older our kids get, sometimes the more of our humanity they draw out of us. But as, as I've told people, and this is a hard for them to hear, honoring your father and mother was not, it didn't say only if they deserve it. It just says, honor thy father and mother. It, says, it doesn't say, keep the Sabbath only if it's convenient, but keep the Sabbath. In other words, make sure that you include rest in your life. And I would say that's probably the hardest one for people in our nation today. Now, you could get over legalistic and say, keeping the Sabbath means that on Sunday you don't go out to eat, you don't do any shopping, all you pretty much do is come to church and, and focus on God. Now, if, if I were to tell you that it was that strict, how many of you folks would either be looking for another pastor or just looking down at the floor whenever I ask about it? Well, don't feel bad because I, I too, when I was brought into the presbytery, I was asked about this and I said, I don't have a problem with it. I believe that's what it says. I have a problem with it because I can't do it. Not as well as it should be done. And they go, well, shouldn't you try harder? I said, you're absolutely right, I should. But that's like, you know, telling a kid who's just starting to lift weights, you should lift 300 pounds. You don't start with 300. You start with just the bar. And sometimes you start with a broomstick, depending on how, you know, how new you are to it. So you've got to kind of build up. You've got to kind of learn these things. Plus, you know, God has a different way in which he interacts with these rules. Because the way that these rules were given to us, they weren't given to us to be oppressive. They weren't given to us to make us feel separated from God. Actually, God gave these, like I said, as a covenant. And what does a covenant do? Have you anybody in here ever entered into a covenant? Well, if you're not sure, look down at your hand. And if you have a piece of jewelry in this general vicinity, and someone else has one too, then you probably have. If you live in a neighborhood, now of course, a lot of folks live on farms and stuff like that, don't have to worry about it. But I bought some land on Gibson County, and let me tell you something. By the purchase of that, I entered into a covenant that tells me exactly how big a house I have to build in order to build out there and what things I can't have. Like I'm not allowed to have chickens or horses. Of course, you know, I probably wouldn't be able to keep them alive for very long anyway, so that's okay. But it's a covenant, which means it's something to join things together, not to separate. So when God gave the law to Moses and to the Israelites, he wasn't doing this to be oppressive, to make them feel bad. He was doing this to teach them how to be included. Think about the very beginnings. What are the first three about? The nature of their relationship with God. He begins with, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. In other words, this is exclusive. In case you weren't sure, because you know, back in the dating time, there's always that question. I always, I always hate to see when someone, when one person thinks it's exclusive and the other one doesn't. And then when I was in the military, I used to have a lot of young airmen in my office. I'm not going to say crying, because they were airmen there. But their eyes were a little bit moist and they were a little bit hurt. But God is very clear. This is an exclusive relationship. It's just you and me. And on top of that, you shall not have any idols. Why is that? He's a jealous God. Well, that's, that's, that, that's why he doesn't have other gods. But the idols is, is, is like that. But it gets to what is an idol? Well, it's something you make. And you can't make God. But that's the hubris of these other gods or other things. When you make an idol, when you make something that you think, and of course many of us today are like, well, we wouldn't do that. And yet, um, it still kind of hangs on. Does anybody here ever have a rabbit's foot? A rabbit's foot? A little keychain, you rub it for good luck? Well, what I always wondered is if, how lucky can that foot be? Because the rabbit that had it done lost it. But yet, we still, I mean, that's just kind of the silliness. How about this? Anybody ever heard knock on wood? Or if you spill salt, throw it over your shoulder? 
or don't walk under a ladder, that's not bad luck, but it can be stupid if someone's up on the ladder doing something. Okay? That's not bad luck, that's just bad timing. But again, we have the sort of superstitions, these things that seep in. And so this idea of making an idol, of making something that replaces God in our heart or that we focus on. Now, we do have some images in our church. We have the cross to remind us. But let me ask you a thing. If when I was trying to get down with the children and if I had fallen and knocked the cross off the table, how many of you would have been slightly aghast? And a little bit worried if I broke it. I can tell you this, one time in a youth group I was trying to explain this to them and now I did this with one of the old pew Bibles, it was already in rough shape. But I took it and I tossed it across the room. Man, they looked at me like I had lost my mind. I said, what's wrong? They go, you just threw the Word of God. And I said, no, I just threw a book. Now, the Word of God can be drawn out of it with the power of the Spirit. But again, that's, that, that's how subtle idolatry can get in there. So God is trying to help us understand. One, I'm it. It's, it's me and you. Two, you don't need to do anything to fabricate anything. I'm with you. I'm coming to you. I will be with you. And it's not under your control. That's kind of the hard thing for us. Because the whole purpose of an idol is so that you can control God. And many of us in these days, we still try. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to pray to God, to ask God for specific things. That is what he told us to do. Pray continuously, to lift up your concerns, to be like the widow who harassed the king until he did as she wanted. So again, it's not wrong to pray to God and ask for things, but when you start thinking, I can manipulate or control God, that's when you're sort of turning God into an idol. You're trying to control God and control how God does things. You can pray for whatever you want, asking for specifics, but at the end of it, remember this. Thy will be done. I trust in you because I know you ultimately will understand. And then he says, you shall not take my name in vain. Now, a lot of people, and I can tell you, I can remember in the military, I had a drill sergeant, and they, they have colorful language. But I had a drill sergeant, there's one thing he would never tolerate. You could, you could use almost any expression you wanted if you were hurt or slipped or fell or were frustrated, but if you took the Lord's name in vain, he would call you a blasphemer, and then he would smoke you which meant that he would work you out until you dropped, because they couldn't hit you anymore, technically. Now, a lot of us think that is what was being talked about here. Well, again, that's not a good idea. But in truth, when he says, do not take the Lord's name in vain, what he's saying is, don't swear by the Lord. Don't try to misuse my name. And quite frankly, the church has been guilty of that for many, many generations. Of trying to put God's stamp on our agendas. And I say the church is in the church universal. I'm not talking about individual churches. But we too sometimes will do that. We will tell somebody, well this must be God's will. Or we'll buy into something because someone else has told us that is God's will. Well the question is, is it truly God's will? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's someone's agenda. But God says, do not do that. Do not put my name on it unless I give you permission. And then he moves into the Sabbath and the others we know. So these rules were given to us to help us. But what do we, and I'm talking we as human beings, normally do when we're given anything pure and sacred and holy? Yes. You know, we mess it up. I mean, it started with the Garden of Eden. You know, and the folks say, well, I wouldn't have. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure. I, I probably would have gotten kicked out sooner. All right? And then the boys mess it up, Cain and Abel, and Subsequently thereafter, up until the time of Noah, God causes the flood, starts kind of over again. And still, shortly thereafter, one of the three boys that was called righteous does not honor his father, if you read the story, and is condemned himself. And so throughout the generations, we have constantly had this predilection, this way of tainting and warping. It's called that sin nature that re resides in us. It's the sinful thing of man that taints and corrupts all of nature. So, what do we do? How do we fix that? Well, you take the little bit of laws that God gave us, the ten, and you extrapolate. You expand. Now, at first, this is done for a good reason. In 
the Talmud, do you know how many laws they have? It's over 600. 613. There you go. Now, that started with 10. Now, if you look at today, the legal books on our documents, our founding fathers started with the Constitution, but, you know, how many volumes of, of laws are there on the books? Let me tell you something. You've tried to build a house recently? Trust me, there's lots of laws. And they seem to get more and more confining. Now, I'm not going to say they're all bad. I think there's probably good intent behind them, but that is what we do. We make more laws, and when we're not sure, we try to regulate common sense, which you can't. But when you have so many people, because you say, well, I would know that, and the simple fact is, yes, you might know that, but I promise you, for every you that knows that, there's a couple out there that don't know that. Have you ever opened up a box and seen a little packet of silicate in there that says, do not eat? And you're like, Pfft. well, there's a reason that's written on the package. There was somebody out there that opened up a box that came from a stereo store that said, look, I got a snack. And then probably sued them. We have a tendency to add on, but the problem with that is it increases power of some, and we know that power corrupts, and the greater the power, the greater the corruption. And so over time, what happened were these laws that were given to join us to God actually became warped, and they became misused and manipulated to the point where they started separating us from God. And so within the Jewish tradition, you'll see as the story progresses up until the beginning of time when Jesus starts interacting with them, these weren't bad people. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, most of them were devoted, faithful people who were just warped by generations of, of twists and turns and additions to the law. And they got caught up in it. And they forgot all about the purpose of the law, which was to connect us with God. And they used it to protect us from God. Or to protect God from us. And so, instead of bringing us closer to God, it separated us. It pulled us away. Now when Jesus comes on the scene in what is one of my favorite stories, I gotta tell you, because it's a unique story. How many of you guys like Jesus clearing the temple? I mean, I mean, that's 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 like the action part of the of the New Testament. I mean, and it wasn't just he came in and said, Y'all need to go. I mean, he goes over there and he starts putting stuff together. And you've got to know, someone knows what he's doing. After he, you know, someone starts putting together a bullwhip in your office. At a certain point, you've got to have an idea of what's about to happen. Because it doesn't happen quickly. But he puts that together, and if he made it, I'm not saying he actually whipped somebody, but I guarantee you there were some people that were uh, ducking and heading for the exits as soon as he cracked it. As long as, not to mention, imagine those of you that have farm animals, you know, sheep are really cute, but I guarantee you, you get a couple of adult sheep moving in a direction, and you're standing there, you're either going to move aside or move with them, or they're going over you. And so he drives them out. It says that he's angry, and of course, we immediately go, well, it was righteous indignation, because, you know, Jesus isn't supposed to get angry. Well, it is righteous indignation, and actually Jesus did get angry. He was upset. Why was he upset? Because all of these things, again, these laws, these manipulations, had twisted and turned to the point where, okay, if you wanted to give... Now imagine if we did this when we took up offerings. Instead of you being able to come up here and put a dollar bill on the plate, because that has somebody's face on it, we were to say, oh no, you can't have idols, so we have to change your money out for our special script. But our special script only comes in three dollar denominations. So if you happen to have three ones, we can make you a deal. But if you have a five, we'll take your five, you don't get any change, and we'll put the three in the plate for you. That's basically what they were doing. They were making money off this. And not only that, but they had to do sacrifices. Now what was the requirement for an animal sacrificed in the temple? It had to be pure and without a blemish. So, what do you think the odds are if you brought your own goat that they were going to find something wrong with it? Very good. It's kind of like your odds of if you take your car to get inspected at the dealership, what are the odds they're going to find something that needs to be replaced? 
especially in certain areas. And I'm not, I, I, almost, I almost threw someone under the bus. I'm not going to do that. But I have experienced that before in my life. You know, you go in for a simple oil change, and you come out, and they go, oh, you actually owe us $700. But we had to fix a few things. Well, but let's face it. I mean, I, I paid. Why? Because I wanted my car back. They paid. Why? Because they wanted to do the sacrifice. And so they had turned the temple, the outer courts, into this marketplace. And it wasn't just a marketplace, but it was a marketplace where highway robbery was authorized. And they were ripping off the people and their faith, and they were using the very things that God gave them to bring them to God to put up barriers between them and God. And so in his righteous indignation, in his anger, he drives them from the temple. Now, if you read the other Gospels, they all include this story. Where do the other three Gospels put it? Right, they all... And so I've had people go, well, well, what's up with that? Well, there's a lot of theories. Some say, well, maybe he did it twice. Because I guarantee you, once he left, they went right back to it. Because people tend to fall back on their nature. I don't really know why he put it here first and, the, and they put it there last, except that one of the things I do know about John is John was very big in showing the different ways from the very beginning that Jesus was the Messiah, and this was one of the clear predictions that the Messiah would do. And so, oftentimes when the Gospels are written, they are not written as a historical chronology. They're written in order to tell a story that gets you to an idea, an understanding. In other words, do you know that there's a difference between facts and the truth? It's not that they're mutually exclusive, but if you're dealing in facts, you're dealing in facts, and those lead to, you know, you put them together and come up with a theory and prove it. But the truth is something that we seek and sometimes we feel, we understand. We come into areas of the truth, sometimes not in a linear progression of facts, but as we begin to understand more about life in general. So Jesus drives them out. He's angry. And the disciples are all like, this is awesome. This is great. And they believe. And then there's that whole confusion at the end. What is it that the, the Jews say to him? Why'd you do this? I mean, think about it. If someone came in, into your place of business or your office and started throwing things over and saying that you weren't doing things right, how many of you would just stand by and let that happen? Without at least going, hey, what's up with this? And so they ask, why are you doing this and by what authority? Give us a sign. And he gives them the sign. He goes, I will tear down this temple and in three days re rebuild it. Which, of course, is kind of ridiculous. If you think about it, I mean, imagine someone coming here and telling us the sanctuary is going to be done in three days. You know, I, 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 and I'm not trying to... It'll be done when it's done, and it's done right. We should be glad of that. But let's face it, we all have time, timelines that we put on things. We have an understanding because we know how the world works. But unfortunately for them, they were dealing in facts. Jesus was dealing in truth. The fact was, if he was to actually destroy the physical temple, it may take longer to rebuild. Of course... Him being the son of God, you know, the angel union, they're pretty good at putting things together quickly. But he wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about his body. He was talking about what he was about to do. He was talking about what he had to do to restore the order. You see, we got, and we still do, get tied up in this idea of the law and the rules. Why do we like rules? Because if we obey them, what happens? Or what's supposed to happen when you obey the rules? Good. Good. Just, if, if you obey the rules and follow all that, I mean, you know, you're playing a sport. That's why we have the guys with the striped shirts. Those that aren't playing by the rules, hopefully, I mean, they're not perfect, but they do get caught and penalized. And the more penalties they get, the better chance the other team has to win. So the more like the rules you play. And in life, if you do what is right, if you obey the rules in your community, in your business, in whatever, then technically or, or in most cases, things work out well, right? I mean, there are occasional setbacks, there are occasional things that happen, but for the most part, if you work hard, do what's right, things will do and turn out pretty good for you. Unfortunately, as things get bigger, more complex, that margin for error starts to get smaller and smaller. And since I've been aware of the rules of life as I've grown up, 
I've seen it change. And everything is not as certain as it once was. And there are people who have questions about where we're going as individuals, as a community, and as a nation. And even as a world. What's going on? I mean, who would have thought we would still be involved in wars in the Middle East? I went back into the military after they had started that and retired out of it before they finished it. Well, things may seem to get worse and crazier. The rules that they try to fix it with, they fix some things, but let's face it, kind of like the regulations stuff we face with housing, with other things, the more you try to fix it, the more difficult it becomes for somebody else. And it just piles on and they get convoluted. And it's to the point now where you can't just have a handshake agreement anymore. Even though that should, should suffice. You almost always have to at least get something written down. You have to, again, play by the, the rules of the world. Because they've taken this law that God had to bring us together. And they've expanded it to the point where it's oppressive. It keeps us from him. It even misguides us. How many of you have thoughts and do things and say things? And I can tell you, I've, I've heard lots of this. But make deals with God. God, if you will do this for me, I will do this for you. Anybody? How about you think, okay, if I act really good, if I, if I, if I be nice to these people, if I, if I pray enough, if I come to enough, enough church, then God will surely give me this. I've heard preachers talk about that because, you know, they go, if you, off, if you put enough in the offering plate, if you come to church, if you work hard enough, if you're on enough committees, God will bless you. Ever heard that before? I'm going to tell you a little secret. God will bless you because God chooses to bless you and it doesn't matter how much you put in the plates or how much work you put in. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things, but you should do them to glorify God and to celebrate your relationship, not because you want to build the relationship. You see, that was the whole point of the commandments. When God gave the law, it was a covenant to build them close. We took that and tried to make it a contract. Okay, God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. I don't know about you, but that sounds almost... Like idolatry. It almost sounds like trying to control God. And so Jesus came and he kicked over a few tables and drove a few cattle. But the most important thing he reminded them of is that he was going to, yes, immediately drive out the folks from the temple, but he was going to fix the temple. And in three days, it would be rebuilt. Yes, he was talking about the temple of his body, but he was also talking about that temple, that location, and our connection with God. That's the point of the crucifixion. Jesus came into this world so he could teach us and show us, but ultimately he came into this world that he could die for our sins and restore us to wipe away all of these burdens, all of this requirement, all this that we think we need the law to prove ourselves to God, and all we need is trusting in him and his work. And what he has done. So we've gone from the law to grace. The law now is oppressive. It tells us what we did wrong. Grace tells us that we belong. That God loves us. He heals and restores us. When we come to this table, we don't come deserving. We come humble. We don't come because we're good enough. We come because Christ was good enough to bring us to him. And provide this table in the midst of of our sinful world, that we would be connected to him. So let us remember all that he has done. And not try to earn our way in, not trying to manipulate God, but just accept what he has done for us. And like I told the children, and then to celebrate it on the other side. Yes, we still need to do what's right, we still need to obey what's in the book, but again, it's that difference between fact and truth. The truth is, our debts have been paid. The truth is, Christ has done for us what we couldn't do ourselves. The fact is, if we left it up to ourselves, we would all fall short. So let us simply praise God, give Him thanks, and walk in His path. Not because we are earning, but because we've been given. Not because we want Him to love us, because He already has. Through Christ, all things have become possible. Through His grace. We are now no longer children of the law, but children of the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Let us pray. Grace, Lord, I give you thanks and praise for the good news that you offer to us, for the grace and the mercy that you offer. And Lord, in spite of our desire to seek to win your favor by what we do, let us remember that you already love us, that you already care for us. And let us live our lives as celebration and tribute to that fact, to your glory, to your honor. May thy will be done. Amen and amen. I now invite you to join me in our communion liturgy. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Let us pray. Eternal God who has created the heavens and the earth. You have given breath to every living thing. We thank you now for the gifts of creation, for the gift of life itself. We thank you that you have made each of us in your own image, that you have forgiven us when we act as though you have no claim upon us, for keeping us in your steadfast care. We rejoice in Jesus Christ, the only eternally begotten by you, who was born of the Virgin Mary, who shared in the joys and the sorrows of life as we know it. We remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection. In the beloved community of your church, we await Christ's return at the end of our history. We take courage from the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst, and we offer you our praise for women and men of faith in every age who stand as witnesses to your love and justice. Therefore, with all the prophets and the martyrs and the saints and the company of heaven, we glorify you. Friends, remember on the night when he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread and he broke it saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take, eat. Do this in remembrance of me. Then in the same manner after supper he took the cup and he blessed it after giving thanks, saying this cup is the new covenant. My blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. Take, drink. Do this in remembrance of me. Now as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ's death. We celebrate his resurrection and await Christ's coming again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ shall come again. The body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sin. Let us pray. Eternal and holy God, as we come to the table that you have prepared for us, we remember the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf, that he was crucified, thus giving his body and his blood as true spiritual food and drink. Thus, in performing this sacrifice and receiving what he has given us through the power of your spirit, let us be filled with his grace and his mercy that we might glorify and praise you all the days that we have in this domain on this earth and be rejoined with you at your bidding according to your will. We pray this in all things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen and amen. Now I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, I Love to Tell the Story.
I love that hymn. <laughs> Receive now the benediction of our Lord. Brothers and sisters, we have gathered the house of the Lord to worship in spirit and in truth. We have heard his word proclaimed. We have gathered around the table that he has prepared for us. Therefore, through the power of the Holy Spirit, receive the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding. May he be and abide in you now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Go in peace to love and serve our Lord.